Shall we begin? I was waiting for some music. I was waiting for the theme tune from Titanic or something like that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bruce Whitfield. I will be facilitating this panel today on what is a very, very special day. And the reason it is a special day is it's, of course, my three-year-old birthday. Minister, you can go, ah. Oh. Ah, oh, thank you, Minister. Um, and the reason why that is relevant is because at a certain time in every parent's life, you have that conversation. Um, it is sometimes started by you, and sometimes it is started by your child. And that conversation is, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, my three-year-old came to me the other day, and he said, you know, Dad, one day I'm going to drive a spaceship, and you and Mom and my brother can come with me. And I thought to myself, either the kid is deluded, which is possible, or he's a great visionary, because maybe in the year 2040, if I'm still around, um, I could become a passenger of his on a spaceship. Uh, the future of technology and the role of space, of course, is absolutely crucial in the evolution of technology. It's, it's thanks possibly to uh, the foresight of John F. Kennedy and others of the 1960s that today we have fantastic devices such as these, um, the technology that was enabled by this desire to explore in space. So the theme for today, the future of technology, using the race to space to push the next technology frontier is a good topic, and it's a topic that we're going to be discussing today. Now, Lady Pandor is the Minister of Science and Technology in South Africa, and she has got ultimate oversight of what is known as the Square Kilometre Array. It's about 300 kilometres from here, Minister. Yeah. And there we go. In the Karoo, um, some of the clearest skies in the world. We won half the bid to host the Square Kilometre Array in South Africa. It's probably the most significant technology investment, global technology investment, in this part of the world ever. Um, and, and then next to her, we've got Indy Jack Harry, who's the president and chief executive, Youth for Technology Foundation, based in Nigeria. Nice to see you as well. Uh, and then we've also got Solomon Asifa, who's director of IBM Research in Africa. Uh, and then Acha Leke, who is an electrical engineer by training, uh, but he is also with Mick. Kinsey. Minister, if I can start with you, just give us context, please, yeah. when it comes to science technology in this part of the world and the significance of the SKA project. Um, well, essentially, what uh, we, we have tried to do as South Africa is to identify areas in which we could build uh, stronger research uh, competence as well as promote uh, innovation. One of the decisions we took several years ago was to make better use of what we called our geographic advantage, and that was to build the astronomy sciences in South Africa and build infrastructure that would be both uh, international in character with international collaboration opportunities, but also enhance the innovation capabilities of a range of institutions in the public and private sector. The Square Kilometer Array is a 3,000 dish uh, a set of connected uh, antennae that allow scientists in the astronomy sciences to carry out uh, a wide range of research uh, and the capability we're anticipating once the build is complete uh, by both ourselves and Australia. And ours is an African partner uh, initiative with eight other African countries as part of this build. Our, it will be the largest radio telescope mm. in the world uh, it's allowed us to invest in a significant human capital development program. We've produced a number of PhDs as well as master's uh, candidates. We've got our engineering firms involved in building radio receivers at the high tech level. We're training technicians to support us with the computer engineering, software engineering uh, growth. So it's just boosted innovation and human capital development in a way that I think we hadn't imagined when we first put a bid for the Square Kilometre Array. It almost feels as if it's up and running already, but it's only due for completion in 2018, isn't it? It's, right? it's a long build program. Uh, both countries had to undertake to build a precursor instrument. That's uh, the, called the, the, called the Meerkat, yeah. which we're building. It'll be a 64-dish uh, radio telescope. It'll be ready in 2017. Uh, we're already doing some science. We have uh, eight of the dishes up already, and uh, we've had some excellent publications in science journals uh, and lovely discoveries. Uh, uh, so 
We, we're very pleased with the progress we're making. We're on track and we'll have the full 64 dish meerkat up in 2017. The build for SKA1, of which meerkat will become a, a part, will begin in 2018. And the intention is to finish the full 3,000 dish mega uh, uh, telescope by 2023. 2023 is the target date. What does that do then? How, what is the knock-on of that? What is the Kennedy effect, if you like, of this for not only this country, but the other eight participants and the region uh, as a whole? What are, the, what are the spillover benefits of that? Well, it's led to a number of very uh, interesting developments, as I've said. But let me just look at the institutional uh, developments with higher universities. Mm. We've established eight research chairs linked to the astronomy sciences. Very significant and important for us because what you're doing is attracting scientists of international caliber to the country and they're training young people who will be the future innovators, the knowledge workers uh, that we want. Which is a nice segue to you, Nidjeka, because you work with young people in technology. You need a pipeline, you need solid education, you need maths and science, and talking to a lot of people in the corridors of this gathering, one of the things upon which people have universally agreed is the African continent as a whole, their pockets of excellence, but doesn't excel in the maths and science fields. So I'll get back to the minister in a bit, who's a former education minister in South Africa as well, uh, for her perspective on that. But what's yours? Absolutely. Thanks, Bruce. We, we know that in Africa as a content, um, if we look at the education sector, the education sector is not just broken. Indeed, in today's environment, it is obsolete. And so there needs to be an entire transformation of the education sector. And to do this effectively and efficiently, it really takes marshalling the forces of multi-stakeholders, which of course include the government, the private sector, and civil society, which I represent, um, that really have to engage and begin to communicate to ensure that the students that are being churned out of these universities uh, have been adequately tra uh, trained to go into the workforce, especially if the workforce is one that's uh, technology focused, to go into the workforce and to add value. And not just that, to be able to actually create employment opportunities themselves. In Nigeria, for instance, 90% of the young people that apply into the universities get declined. So only 10% of the applicants actually get into the universities, complete a four or five year um, education. But at the end of it, they continue to remain underemployed. They continue to remain undereducated or many of them are even unemployed in their entirety. Mm -hmm. So it's the role of really civil society, government, and private sector to ensure that they have the adequate skills, they have the adequate knowledge to be able to go into the workforce as enthusiastic employees or really create jobs in their communities as well um, in science and technology. We know that science, technology, engineering, and math is really the cornerstone of a nation's development. And everyone needs to be engaged. When we look at Nigeria in particular, some data recently showed that you know, if Nigeria included the number of women coming out of universities and gaining employment, if they had the same opportunity as men, they would be able to drive the gross domestic product of the country up by about 13.9 billion. So this is significant. So we're not just looking at, at science, technology, and engineering and math, but we're looking at it also within the very, very inclusive context in which it, it really needs to be analyzed in. Hmm. Solomon, I mean, you work in the real world, in the trenches of technology. You uh, are director of IBM Research in Africa. What is your assessment of the skills that are present on this continent to carry forth the dream that the minister espouses. Okay. Uh, prior to touching on the skills aspect of it, uh, I just want to say a few words on sure. why we are so excited about the Square Kilometer Array project. Um, of course, the Square Kilometer Array is one of the boldest and most daring visionary projects of the 21st century in terms of discovering what exactly happened between the Big Bang and the first formation of a star, right? So, that's a big vision for the whole world and for the continent to be leading in that itself is you know, a new story for us. But there's something much deeper than that, which is 
parallel to what has been happening in the supercomputer world, right? So governments often invest on a decade-long project, a big exascale supercomputer, and what you see there is it drives quite a lot of research and development initiatives. You have to rethink how you do nanotechnology, cooling technologies, how you connect chips. So it really leads to a whole set of new types of industries. And we do see the same parallel with the SK effort. How do you build rugged computing that you can actually you know, deploy in a very heated environment? That by itself has not been done yet. How do you interconnect all those you know, 3,000 uh, radio telescopes in a very efficient manner? Is that the work that is going to be done on the African continent, however? Was that work that's going to be done elsewhere for efficiency's sake and brought in? It is going to be done here. It's been done. That's why you're seeing quite a lot of collaboration between different stakeholders, including government and the private sector. And the truth is, you know, the way we do science has really evolved over time. No one company can invest enough money to innovate on its own. It has to be a collaboration between universities, it has to be a collaboration between government, industries, and so forth. But most importantly, you actually have to be where the challenge is. You really need to be having that real world experience and innovating and forming new ecosystems if you want to tackle this type of grand challenges. That's the only way to do it, which means we have to be involved in skill development. Absolutely. As well. Ecosystems are, is a good word. We'll come back to it uh, in just a little bit. But back to the question, which was, are we adequately resourced on this continent to deliver all of yes. what you talk about? We absolutely are. And oftentimes, for example, when a company like IBM decides to establish a research center, it's often because the skills are available. Right? You, of course, have to start with 10 scientists, 20 scientists, or maybe even 50 scientists. But if you start with, at a small scale, it gives you the time frame to develop thousands of scientists. Yeah. You just need to have a very good roadmap, a very well-studied uh, roadmap on how you're going to get those skills. You know, education oftentimes takes four to six years for a PhD, sure. but it also makes you rethink even how education is done. You know, is there a way to produce PhDs within two years? Okay, but... I mean without being too disrespectful to the minister in my educations, we're the only African-educated people on this panel. I mean, you guys started out here, but the three of you um, left the continent to broaden your minds and, and to, grow your, to, to, to grow your skills. Is that an imperative? Well, I, I would say, actually, that the, you know, the lessons I learned before I left the continent are what helped me sure. in my you know, undergraduate and graduate work. So we do have good schools. We need to change them. We do need to change how we do education. But the and skills... The says they're obsolete. says our education system is obsolete. It's not adequate to prepare us for, for a future. Actually, I mean, what's your perspective on this one? I mean, is the African education system inadequate? Minister, I'll give you a turn now. She's uh, giving me ha the hairy eyeball. Um, uh, is is, is Jacka correct on that particular point? Well, I mean, as, as a co-founder of a school, um, I would argue that, that things are absolutely changing on the continent. Mm. Um, I, I do think that in the past, if you look five, ten years ago, that was absolutely the case. Um, and back to Jeneka's point, if you think of Nigeria, Nigeria graduates, you know, 1.7 million students from high school. They have universities lost for 400,000, right? And the, that's not even talk about the quality. Now, what you're seeing is a lot of innovation going into education. Right? And I'll just give you an example. Um, I'm involved in, in an initiative called the Africa Leadership University. And the idea here is to create 25 universities across Africa um, and sort of at the Ivy League level, but do that in Africa and not have to send our kids outside. And the reason we did it is because we founded a school called the Africa Leadership Academy, and we get 4,000 applications every year. We select 100 kids, but you know most of them end up in the US for university. And then they come back here. So we said, what can we do to make sure that we can keep those skills here and, and have that quality of education in Africa? And the interesting thing is, is through technology, we're now we're going to be able to significantly reduce the cost base to deliver this education through some blended learning and significantly increase the quality so you get the best professors from all over the world delivering education to this on the first campus is opening in Mauritius um, in, in September. And that's why I agree um, that, that things are changing, yeah. um, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. Minister? Well, yes, things are changing. Um, I don't agree that uh, education on the entire continent is obsolete. I think there are parts where there's huge inequality. Sure. And uh, 
totally inadequate use of technology, some of the curricula are very old and traditional, uh, but many countries have made changes and are using new frameworks, and you're seeing a greater uh, a utilization, particularly of mobile technology, in many schools uh, on the continent. So I do think there are changes, um, but much more needs to be done. Where I think there is a challenge is in uh, a large number of young people moving up the scale in education. I think the basic education has been an attention area for many policymakers, but they tend not to look at what the next steps are. And so in some countries, they've achieved near universal access for primary education. They haven't built enough secondary schools so kids, kids reach a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, some countries have still one university. They're producing many more children from secondary school. They can't be absorbed. Others only have, as post-school, universities, whereas you should have vocational education. That's where the entrepreneurship and other opportunities are, mm. much more in the vocational and technical fields. We still tend to be top-heavy with university uh, 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 qualification and entry rather than other uh, forms of education. And if you want to build uh, the number of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises Africa needs, you're going to have to steer more and more young people into vocational and technical mm. education. Absolutely. Solomon, you made the point about ecosystems. Um, and I speak with a South African bias, it's the story I know best, um, but Elon Musk, who is one of the poster boys of science and technology in the United States, Silicon Valley, taking the world by storm, left South Africa, went off to Silicon Valley to seek his dreams. He's got a cousin who runs Solar City, a bunch of really bright and capable people who didn't have an adequate ecosystem at home, who went elsewhere. And the trouble is, once they go elsewhere, it's hard to bring people back. How do we deal with that? Well, I think, I mean, from my perspective, the story is changing. There is a kind of a bending point or an inflection point that's happening. And for the most, most part, that's because big industrial players are seeing big opportunities. I mean, they project forward to 2050, and they see that there's going to be big opportunities. So they are coming in and saying, let's do research and development together, right? And that type of investment is changing uh, how we are engaging and it's attracting talent. Uh, we've been very fortunate to, for example, bring back many Africans uh, back to our research labs, both in Nairobi as well as South Africa. Uh, they look at the vision. They look at what we're trying to do. The key is to inspire them by saying, mm -hmm. we have grand challenges, but the way we're going to solve them is by actually innovating the next set of technologies. You know, we're going to be using artificial intelligence, you know, the best sensor technologies, and we're going to be using cognitive computing. When you tell them that, you know, the frontier of science is actually having a role now to transform how the continent is working, it's, uh, it becomes very inspiring. They, they look at that more than the money or some of the issues that they might have because they have, you know, they relocate. It goes back to your point of how do you inspire them? How do you catch them so that they're back? So working? what are you doing in real terms? IBM Research Lab, that's the theory. What are you doing practically? Give me a, tell me a tale uh, of somebody who's come back and is just so thrilled that they did and abandoned the opportunity at the Googleplex or wherever they've left um, to, to come back. Sure, I mean, I, I can give you an example from just a couple of weeks ago. Um, a very bright, a South African who graduated from one of the best colleges in the world, being offered many job opportunities, uh, but she heard ab about the story of research and development, and she started to connect some of her learnings in robotics and uh, machine vision to how it could apply to actually change how we do infrastructure, the role of autonomous uh, systems to really rethink how we put together infrastructure and the person chose to come back because there is a big opportunity to become a thought leader, one of the best scientists in the world. So that's how you have to attract them and tell them that, look, you know, you are the next thought leader, but the opportunities to do great science is here. We have to relocate. I, I, 
personally and professionally, I don't think there's a problem uh, with South Africans being in institutions overseas. No, not at all. What we've got to become really good at is establishing international collaboration. Mm. So, for example, we're working very hard on partnership initiatives. We're already doing research on lithium-ion uh, uh, batteries mm -hmm. at the CSIR. So we've said to our team, speak to Elon Musk. Let's see what we do. And I've been to Silicon Valley, interestingly enough, and met a group of South Africans who are very successful there and who want to work with us to expand the startups, particularly in the information communication mm. technology field. And they're saying there's huge amounts of talent in South Africa. We want to work with you to establish enterprises in South Africa, but on the continent as well. Let's create common funds and work together sharing expertise. So for me, global can be very positive for local. Mm. I think what I'll add to that is, you know, the benefits of technology and collaboration, whether it's with the international universities, with universities here in research and development, technology affords that ease of mm. communication today that perhaps it didn't offer, you know, several years ago, five to ten years ago. Secondly, a lot of young, um, you know, young researchers, young developers um, that are a part of the African diaspora overseas sometimes see government as a, as a disabling factor to innovation, right? And whether that's hindering um, from the tax incentive part or from, you know, patent introduction and the ease of getting patents rolled out, etc. And so the ability for governments to be a part of that enabling ecosystem to offer tax incentives that are attractive for these young people um, as they think about their innovations and their ideas and monetizing those ideas so that they see a reason, um, a beneficial reason to come back and play a part of what is going to be, you know, the next um, you know, developed world, per se, in the area of research and development. Acha, is anybody succeeding in the, on that incentive basis? I mean, as, as a consultant, you understand the, the, wor the world of incentives very well. Um, is anybody getting it right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the conversation is, in my mind, quite uh, a bit negative around, you know, things are not working. I think the number of things are working, mm -hmm. right, across mm -hmm. a, a number of sectors. And, 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 you know, we focus a lot on education, but the power of technology to transform the continent and to transform our lives, and I'll come back to sure. your question, I think is, is extremely powerful, right? And, you know, we believe that, um, you know, the internet could, could account for about 10% of Africa's GDP in the next 10 years. Yeah. And we see the impact, on, and that'll, just to give you a sense, that's about $300 billion. That's the size of the South African economy, right? That's how powerful the internet, uh, we believe, can be uh, for the continent. Where people are getting it right is really starting to look at how do I use this technology in very specific sectors, right? So if you look at what uh, the Nigerian former, I guess now, Minister of Agriculture, who's about to be, who's now then soon to be president of the, or the elect, president elect of the African Development Bank, did to transform how fertilizers are delivered in Nigeria through its e-wallet system. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just now that the farmers were able to get the fertilizer more, but it also reduced leakages and corruption significantly across, across the sector. You look at what's happening on the e-commerce front, you look even on the, on the government front, right? Now, if you want to go visit Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal, you don't need to go to the embassy, leave your passport there for three days, hope that you get the visa, da da da. You know, you apply online and they send you a piece of paper and you fly and you land there and you get a visa, right? So there are a number of these things that are happening across, an, uh, across sectors. We need to see it more at scale, um, but we're definitely starting to see the inflection point. Okay, so back to the question. Um, yes. we're, we're, where are we then? I mean, how do we get the incentives right to get these people back to this continent yeah. to grow the sector? So, so I think there are a couple of things. One is um, uh, the government has a role to play. Right, so you know, for but our us, government's doing it well. Our government's certain, enablers, or, or so not? some are. I'll give you, you know, so we have a metric called the IGDP, the internet contribution to GDP. The average in Africa is 1.1 percent, right? Extremely low. Uh, the average of developed countries is 3.7 percent. Now, mm -hmm. Senegal is the highest in Africa at 3.3 percent. Uh, Kenya is the next highest at 2.9 percent. And everybody talks about what's happening in those countries from. Uh, telecom sector perspective from deploying infrastructure, from having the right strategies in place. So some governments are doing it right. Yep. Uh, Rwanda is looking to do the same thing and really leverage ICT to transform as the next big sector uh, for the country. But I think uh, in many countries, we still have a big problem around, I'm not just going to blame government, but just, you know, government, you know, 
policy prioritization of the ICT sector, I think that can, that's, that can be a challenge. And uh, there's a challenge around, and we haven't spoken about it, but I think around financial incentives, right? How do you provide all the startups we're talking about? How do you provide either the venture capital, the mm -hmm. early stage financing for these to get going, you know, until they can start raising private equity type money? That's a challenge in many of our countries. The ICT, I agree that some people are coming back. A number of us who were studying, you know, I studied in Silicon Valley, came back. But still, we're very far from having the, the, the base of talent that we need to transform the ICT mm -hmm. sectors in our countries, right? So, so I think you have to, we have to come down to that level of granularity to understand which countries are doing it but, uh, and, and, and which levers need to be pulled to transform uh, the mm -hmm. sector. Questions from the floor, anybody? Um, is, uh, are we hitting the right notes for you? Um, I'm struggling to see in the dark. Um, I'll take your silence as acquiescence. Otherwise, uh, there is a hand and there is a microphone, two wonderful combinations. So could you tell us who you are, where you're from, and who you'd like to direct your question to? Thank you. I'm Brian Wafaroa. I work for Pearson, and I'm the chair of the publishing industry. I enjoyed working with uh, Ma Pando when she was Minister of Education. I really appreciate the thrust that we are making in high-tech innovation and technology, and I think we should continue to try and lead the world in that area. But I'm also concerned about what's happening in the rural areas. Because everywhere where you find people, they are grappling with their day-to-day -day problems. And if you look carefully, there are solutions that they are coming up with. I attended the Innovation Summit of the European Chamber of Commerce in Geneva. And the best presentation there was from India. What they were doing was they had uh, an incubation fund that looked at people in rural areas and how they were dealing with their problems. The innovation there included something as rudimentary as uh, shifting the load from the head to the shoulders with the harness, climbing up a palm tree and harvesting right. fruit from there, and creating amphibian bicycles to cross rivers in the rural areas. So they would take the fund, scale it up, and bring back to that community. And some of the technology, like the tree climbing system, was being uh, exported to the U.S. with a slogan like, they will beat us to the moon, but we'll beat them to the top of the tree. <laughs> your, your, question, your question, please. My question is, within that context, in addition to what we are doing with the SKA and other high-tech innovation, do we have programs to deal with innovation that is in the rural areas and assist them scale it up or even commercialize it? Great question. Real-world innovation versus uh, high academia minister. Mm. Yes, certainly. Um, what we've done as South Africa is establish what we call technology localization stations, mainly in rural uh, communities linked to universities. And what the stations provide is access to technology and innovation support to communities. We've had two very good examples, one in Limpopo, in Goa Goa, close to Tsanin, where a demonstration plant on fruit preservation and uh, pressing of fruit for juice has now gone to become a manufacturing facility. So it began as a pilot plant with this technology station support and is now a thriving business that uh, communities have economic and ownership uh, 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 employment uh, and support from. A uh, second example is the work we're doing uh, in indigenous knowledge systems. There are over 4,000 indigenous plants that are utilized by healers in South Africa without any statutory recognition, no research support, etc. We're working with uh, uh, practitioners in order to bring these uh, remedies, they're nutraceutical, cosmeceutical, into the commercial space with communities and practitioners having ownership. So we've actually got legislation uh, supporting this. So there are a range of initiatives. We've also established uh, sector innovation funds, which are along the lines that uh, you've referred to with the India uh, example, where we're working especially in the agricultural space in a range of sectors uh, to support uh, innovation and research and technology access. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one thing I was going to say, I mean, I actually don't think we have a lack of innovation in Africa, right? I mean, we just, and it's, it's, whatever the government does, I think people just find ways to do different things, right? And, 
Uh, the, well, the issue we have is how do we scale it? That's yeah. my sense. And how do you go from you know everybody doing what they're doing? In many cases, we don't even know about it because they're just solving a problem. Uh, to how do you scale it? I'll give you an example. We have um, one of our students uh, the, who was at ALA again. This is a guy called William Kamkwamba. You probably heard of him. You know, he dropped out of school in Malawi when because he couldn't afford to eighty dollars to go to school. He went to the library in his village, read about how windmills are produced, built a windmill in his village. He didn't need the government to come and show him how to do it. Mm -hmm. He just figured it out. It powered the house. People heard about it. We found him five years later. Took him to ALA. He went to Dartmouth. Now he's at IDEO. Now he wants to, you know, he has found a part of land in Malawi where he wants to build a wind, uh, a, a wind farm that's going to uh, triple the energy contribution to the country. Now the issue is back to the ecosystem, right? If, mm -hmm. if not, not us, but if, if he had never left Malawi, would mm -hmm. he have been able to get there? No, but right? that's the point. I mean, so, and it's, it's that ability to grow great ideas. Exactly. It doesn't matter where the seed is germinated, mm -hmm. provided it does. And is that the risk then, Jack? I mean, that we, we run the risk of tech being top down and saying, here's a solution, implement. Right. Um, and it's not necessarily practical or useful. Um, there's there's got to be right. uh, some, some real world experience in there as well. Absolutely. And I mean, rural areas, you know, in Nigeria, for instance, the, the unemployment rate in the rural areas is somewhere around 46%. 97% of the young people who walk through our doors at Youth for Technology Foundation say that they want to change the world. Now, what this looks like is, is to be determined. But an idea is only just that, an innovative idea. Yes, there's innovation, absolutely. But an innovative idea is, is, is just that, unless it is monetized, right? And so it's not just teaching um, and inspiring people towards technology innovation, but it's also teaching them those life skills, those entrepreneurship skills, like leadership and empathy, to be able to monetize the idea towards greatness, indeed. And the rural areas have a lot to offer. I mean, in our, in our work, we, we actually believe in this concept called reverse migration, mm -hmm. encouraging young people to stay in their rural areas, um, develop talent, learn as much as possible and then create jobs through entrepreneurship as opposed to moving to the urban areas you know where there's this population crisis this high crime etc and so we, we fundamentally believe that this can happen and happen successfully um, there's one of our students Sonny he started off with us um, in one of our programs at Youth for Technology Foundation when he was 22 years old. He was still enrolled in the university. He came in as, you know, just learning basic digital literacy. After about a year with us, um, he graduated and decided he wanted to go into the field of entrepreneurship. And he started a livestock farming. So, um, you know, he, he farmed grass cutters and sold them. His clients were hotels and restaurants, etc. And he's, he's doing extremely well. And he's in his local community. So he never left the villages. He ended up hiring his local community, people from his village, to work in the business. He's growing his business. His customers now include rural areas and urban areas, but still, in terms of that ecosystem, it's being built in the rural areas. And, and to us, this is just a magical story. Well, yeah, I, I, I agree with most of the comments, but at the same time, I sometimes get a bit concerned. I mean, when I hear all this news about, you know, mobile penetration and how many mobile phones we have and so forth. That's so, you know, 20th century. <laughs> the world has moved on yeah. and we're talking about cognitive computing. Yeah. Mm. I do think that we need to be riding that exponential curve and we should be thinking 10 years ahead, not 10 years back. Yes, we have to have low-end technologies, we have to have, uh, you know, digital literacy and so forth, but why don't we think about our own big, you know, bold initiative, an Apollo mission where within a decade, we say, you know, we use, you know, certain technologies like, you know, AI, where we know that there's going to be, I don't know, a thousand scientists that are going to be produced, there's going to be a million jobs, and we just go ahead and do it. Yeah. If we have a bold vision like that one, then, you know, you just go and implement, and we just drive the whole continent to a, new, a newer level instead of always being catching up. Uh, and, that, and that's one of the things, one gets the sense that there's a sense of defeatism almost, like we, who are we to dare to compete? And Jacko, I mean, we're, we're, uh, who are we to dare to compete? So I mean, you know, yes, there's AI, AI technologies, but look at some other technologies, for instance, 3D printing, advanced yeah, manufacturing exactly. technologies like 3D printing can enable someone, anyone living anywhere to actually create 
imagine the world and the future they, they see the world to be and actually create that. And so you now begin to think about this concept of micro factories um, and, and really enabling that ecosystem and entrepreneurial environment with very, very little capital. You know, a young entrepreneur in, in XYZ country in Africa can just dream up an idea. They want to start manufacturing phone cases or what have you. And, you know, with limited capital, purchase a 3D printer and begin that business and, and hire people and actually become, you know, an entrepreneur. Will they ever grow a business of sufficient scale to warrant their genius being applied in their domestic market? Or, well, do, they have, or do they have to do the Elon it, Musk? It depends on what you mean by scale. Uh, take over the world. Because, well, well, we'll take over the world with the SKA, we think, <laughs> but, uh, and discover much more about it. Uh, but if I'm a, a young person uh, who has access to these M labs that we deploy across the country, and they develop a, a, a box, which is a jewelry box, using their 3D uh, imaging technology, and we say we're going to use this as a product that pu public procurement mm -hmm. uh, purchases, that young man employs more people, is making a little, et cetera. So I think scale must be scale you know, and not our scale. It's what uh, the young people sure. or the young entrepreneur uh, uh, would like to achieve. So I think there are a range of devices and we have to use them really well. On the ecosystem, I think this whole, this whole thing of an innovation ecosystem, and that's missing mm. uh, on the continent because we're having a lot of inventiveness, a lot of very good knowledge creation, but it falls into a deep hole at some point. Now, what we have to create are instruments that close that gap, and we've done so with the Technology Innovation Agency. When we first began it, we thought we would be funding uh, innovation coming out of research bodies like universities. But we quickly realized, actually, young people out there are doing stuff that's worthy of development for the commercial space. Silicon Valley so, was, wasn't created out of the government initiative. It was like-minded people gravitating to a point This is the point I was gravitating, gonna make, is that uh, gravitating to in a South point Africa, naturally. you also have to encourage the private sector, mm. uh, which is very big, has lots of money, to play a far greater role uh, than it's doing. You spoke earlier of incentives. We have a very favorable incentive uh, regime for uh, research and innovation mainly accessed uh, by the private sector. Solomon, are you, are you benefiting from those incentives at IBM? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. No, I'm absolutely. just verifying. Just verifying. I think there are some interesting <laughs> developments that are happening. For example, co-sharing of intellectual property. Yeah. How do you work together so that you move very fast from research to commercialization? And all of that, we're doing it together. And, and the, the interesting thing here is, you know, you learn through trial and error. So uh, every year we are really perfecting the method to get there. Uh, actually, you very well behaved. You put your, your hand up like the kid at the back of the class. Yeah, so no, I, 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 I try to. Yeah. Um, uh, your contribution? No, so I actually believe that our issue is not at all an issue of vision. I think in Africa, you know, we have these visions and these grandiose plans. But I don't know, last time we went to Nigeria, you know, I've never seen anybody as bold as a vision as a Nigerian, right? Now, um, <laughs> our issue is execution. Yeah. Right, and that's where the rubber hits the road, and that's where we, and not just on, you know, on technology, you know, we fail to execute. And so the problem for me is, yes, if we say we want to develop a 3D printer or an advanced manufacturing industry, uh, you know, what role does the private sector have to play? How many scientists do we need over the next 20 years to do that? Where are we today? What's the starting position? In many countries, we don't even know the starting position, right? And what are we going to do to get there? And how do we track to say, okay, three years from now, how many have we created? Seven years from now, how many have we created? And that's really the issue. For me, it's an issue really about execution at that yeah. sort of, you know, granular level. Absolutely. At that point, can I pause and take questions from the floor, please? Um, we have several. Um, who's got the microphone? The person with the microphone is in charge. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks very much. I, I just want to take a point that you've raised, Bruce, that says the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley were not developed by government. I think we should not leave here with that notion as being a complete part of the story. Uh, because government created the condition, no, the correct. state of California actually Enabling, made, yeah. made, made that. And in fact, my second point is that we should always be very careful about comparing ourselves yeah. with government in the US now. If we want to do the comparison, 
we should look at the incentives and the policies that the US government designed even as early as the mid 70s. And if you have a, a time at some point, we can share with you the frameworks and the legal instruments that government put in place to try and shape the public investment in research and how those public funds are translating. In fact, as a simple example, on the things that we're seeing when they, they design the space program, and today we have <laughs> cell phones and we have, so yeah. I, I would hope that we balance uh, that, uh, th that. Thank motion. you for the Thanks points. Around. There's a, a question at the front here and then another one at the front uh, as well. Uh, this gentleman on his iPad, courtesy of the space race. Yeah, you had your hand up. No, you didn't. Here we go. Top technology. Your turn. Okay. Um, I have a question. Well, how do you build an investment culture in Africa? Um, I often hear the word venture capital, you know, when I'm talking to young people and they're saying venture capital, when they really need a seed funding or angel investment, like venture capital comes later. So what are your thoughts on building that type of investment culture? Thank you. Who wants to pick up on that? And the jacket looks like it's right up your alley. If you say so, Bruce. So, <laughs> well, so, you work with the young people. You're, so the industry, young. in terms of the VC industry in Africa, is still relatively new yeah. um, compared to, of course, the developing countries. Um, you know, when the, the most of the young people that we see um, with our work are actually looking at seed capital from either microfinance institutions or just commercial institutions themselves. They started off their venture, you know, what we call FFF, friends, family, and fools, right? Anyone that will lend them money. And, and so they built their, their ventures up to a certain scale. But there's, there's a foundation that needs to be developed and oftentimes they haven't built that foundation to be able to go to whether it's commercial banks or even angel investors. And that's, you know, their, their books are not very often not in order. Their financial statements are not in order. They haven't projected their businesses out long enough to understand when exactly they'll break even, when exactly they may be revenue, if at all. And so those are some of the challenges that we still face and we fundamentally believe that that still starts with education and there's still, there's ongoing education there's advancements being made, but there's still a lot that can be done in that space. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if I, mean I, you know, I think that's, that's one of the big issues, the lack of angel investing across Africa, mm -hmm. right? And if you, I always say, you know, when, when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, right, you know, he didn't go to Wells Fargo to ask for a loan, right? Uh, when the Google guys started Google, you know, they didn't go to Bank of America. And, and that's what we do here. We try to go to a bank, and that's not what the bank is, 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 is set up to do. Um, if you look at the people who, who, who lead angel investing, you know, in, in the U.S., or even, you know, even in Europe, these typ are typical entrepreneurs who've actually made the money, right? And sort of, you know, they use it to back entrepreneurs, but also to make more money. And we've not got into that virtual cycle yet. Uh, and as such, what you see is governments needing to step in to start to create some of these funds. And you're starting to see that in some country, Nigeria has put one together for the tech sector. Um, but over time, we just need more of the successful entrepreneurs to kind of see that a bit here in, in, in the Cape Town area, right? more of the successful entrepreneurs to step in and do that. But that is a fundamental gap. We need more Peter Thiels. Exactly. Um, on, we need more effort. mega entrepreneurs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we've got to start somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, Hence, this, this is about the sowing the seed. That's why we have the, the Technology Innovation mm. Agency and our small business development department is looking at uh, improved support for tech startups. So we have begun, um, but I think the private sector has to do much more uh, and be much more uh, uh, risk interested than risk averse, uh, which I think is the current climate, and, and that is a challenge. I mean, Gloria Sorobe has been making some interesting comments. There was a report by McKinsey, um, and she makes the point that business, particularly in South Africa, uh, is doing business the way it did 25 yeah. years ago and hasn't evolved its its approach. And she's in the South African business sector herself. Mm -hmm. Questions from the floor? Questions from the floor? Anybody else? Do I have any bids from the floor? Yes. Oh, there you are again. There we go. It's another um, one. Oh, hello. I'm sorry. You're in the same place. My name is Talama Harry. I'm with uh, Youth for Technology Foundation. And um, there's a coincidence. Yes, yes. terribly. <laughs> Complete coincidence. It's the family business. Um, there we go. <laughs> I had a question about. Um, leveraging uh, distance learning technologies. Uh, someone mentioned that previously, and um, I think that is a, a powerful tool for, uh, for institutions in Africa to leverage uh, learning um, that is generated or learning uh, tools that are generated uh, internationally and um, to leverage content that is developed internationally to help uh, supplement the education in Africa. 
And uh, I think there's just a huge amount of, of content out there that is, is very high quality. And um, you know, I want to understand how we can better leverage it, how we can better use it. Who would you like to direct your question to particularly? Um, Actually, Leckie, I think, uh, was the one who brought that <laughs> yeah, so, up. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so I mentioned, I mean, I'll just give you one example of what we're doing again with Ailey, because you're absolutely right, which is, uh, and you're starting to see more and more of that uh, with Africa Virtual University trying to do things like that. But um, it, if you reflect on, you know, went you went to university and, you know, how many really outstanding professors you had in your four or five years of university, generally people can count on one hand, right, you know, how many really truly outstanding professors. And we say it's because typically, especially in the US and in Europe, professors are there to do research, right? And they're not really there to teach, and sort of the, they're not even happy they have to teach, right? Because, you know, <laughs> they want to get tenure and they, they want to do research. So what we're trying to do at ALU is to say, look, let's find the most amazing professors from anywhere in the world, right? So you get a professor from UCT on economics, you get one from Harvard, you get one from Wharton, um, and, and you digitize that course, right? And that's, that's what you offer the students, right? And then you, you combine that with some peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, and you combine that with actually hiring people who want to teach. And these don't have to be PhDs, by the way. They could be retired, retired professionals. They could be mid-career professionals. They could be people who just Just great educators. Right. I mean, yeah, just that's... people who just really want to know how to teach. And by the way, that model then significantly reduces your, your cost, right? So you can offer an education. We can offer it for five, six, seven thousand $7,000 versus $60,000 at Harvard, right? Um, and so that is a bit the model we're trying. Um, and we're starting to see more and more people going down that path. Mm. Um, Minister, I think this was a very courageous experiment, and I'm sure it'll be revisited. Panyasa Lusufi, who is a, a local um, education minister in one of the provinces in South Africa, distributed something like 70 or 80,000 iPads into schools. Those have had to be withdrawn because um, they were being stolen by outsiders from schools, so there was a security issue there. But a courageous step yeah. that they'll revisit and, and, and look at again, yeah. but it's precisely that sort of move that enables access to this kind of education. Mm. I wish he had spoken to us before he began the experiment. Did you try that? Because we, were are, we yeah. are doing a, a pilot which we're now expanding in the Eastern Cape, and we've been uh, largely successful because we got a community compact with both parents and teachers, and we linked the introduction of tablets and mobile technology to introduction of other technologies to improve the condition of the local schools. So we had uh, alternative uh, uh, sanitation, uh, uh, we have uh, renewable energy sources, so we brought a whole range of technologies and really had an engagement with the community because in the end, the community has to protect the product. Completely. It cannot mm. be uh, uh, left to Lesufi uh, uh, we'll, in we'll Johannesburg. So uh, I've given him a call you and have. we're going to I be working together be. with him uh, because it's not the first time that this has been tried. Yeah. Uh, they tried uh, with hardware when Angie Mochecha uh, was the MEC and had same problems. So I think we need a different approach. Yeah, think about and it. And we are, we are talking and working together. Good. Solomon? Yes, the technology companies are also becoming extremely active in this space because we do have the need for the skills. So we want to take three to six months training data scientists, you know, analysts, uh, uh, data center specialists, and so forth. So what we're doing is Wherever we are, anyway, we are setting up clouds, hybrid or private clouds, you know, micro clouds. We're working with the universities to set up their cloud infrastructure. And we have ready-made courses that are company agnostic. You know, it doesn't matter where you go and work for, HP or IBM, but we do have the courses for mobile computing, uh, data science, and, you know, other technology-related courses. So we're actually providing those for free so that students that are interested will go and take those courses and be ready for the next employment. Nijeka, your, your job, your role is in the empowerment of young people, the unleashing of the creativity of young minds. Just give me a sense, please, of how you are doing it and what the rest of us can learn from your experience. Well, so we, we started our work 15 years ago and uh, in, in Nigeria primarily, and when we started that work, um, we were working with young people, primarily in the rural areas, who had very low 
low courage to really step out of their understanding of what they believe the world should look like. So whether it's, you know, even if their parents were uneducated, they knew in their minds that they needed to become a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. You know, entrepreneurship was absolutely not a viable career for them. And so just giving the young people, like I said earlier, not just the hard skills, those are important, technology or otherwise, but also the soft skills to really live a sustainable life and achieve what they fundamentally feel is changing the world for them and their families is what we try to inspire. Technology is an enabler, but it's, it's not the end. It's a tool that we use to inspire them. Um, I think another point that I was actually going to add here um, to, uh, to Solomon's point when he talked about what IBM is doing in terms of creating curriculum and uh, creating, I, I guess, company agnostic curriculum, is we really should really try to think about how the private sector can enter the school. So the secondary schools, especially at that level, bring the lab at IBM to the classroom. How can we engage working, you know, the working environment, the courses, the knowledge, the talent at IBM in the R&D and scientist um, field, how can we bring that into the classroom so that young people don't have to wait until after secondary school when they're officially unemployed and undereducated to then begin to learn. So bringing the private sector into the classroom, I, I think, you know, is an extremely powerful approach. I don't think we've done enough of that in Africa, mm -hmm. except, of course, at ALA. <laughs> the, 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 theme, the theme is coming through strongly. Questions from the floor? Any more questions from the floor? There we go. There is a microphone over there. You're walking straight past the nice man. There we go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Behi. I'm a global shipper from Egypt. So uh, I work in technology. And as far as I love technology, however, I, I have a concern. Uh, uh, probably I'll be addressing my, my friend from IBM or McKinsey about uh, what they are doing about that. Uh, uh, I have a concern that we are almost limiting the, the, the user to the info we want to get him. As, as far as we go tec more technologically advanced, the data is, is more personalized, and the results that everyone is getting, uh, uh, if, if I'm taking an example of, of search, uh, if you search for Egypt, for example, from, uh, from South Africa, you will get a result. And if, if you search from uh, um, uh, Europe, you will get completely different results. I understand that the results are becoming more personalized, which is what technology is helping us uh, uh, doing right now. However, I believe we are manipulating the, the, okay. uh, uh, the scene uh, to an extent, and we're probably uh, locking people inside their own bubble of, of knowledge, and, and which is conflicting with the global trend the, of, of the having... The question. Yeah, yeah. The, the question, uh, wh wh what do you guys think about that in terms of uh, uh, while you're designing uh, 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 that technology? How do you so address me, such a... Such how, a how, how, are you, how are you thinking about, about the problem? Well, what you just indicated seems to be a kind of a Google-specific uh, <laughs> problem. And, uh, well, I'll give you a counterexample. I mean, think about personalized medicine. Now, that is a goal that we need to strive for, right? And there's a lot of technologies that need to happen so that, you know, based on, of course, you have to build layers of security to make sure that your personal and confidential information is not going to be exposed anywhere. But the fact that you're personalizing uh, medicine to a specific person, even based on, you know, genomic markers, or the fact that you're specifically providing information to a young person on one kind of uh, health-related activities that he or she needs to do, so that 10 years down the line, you know, the person is not going to be suffering from diabetes is going to be a very important advance. Yes, I mean, there are some negatives uh, to some of this development, but I think it's things that we can mitigate. I mean, it depends on what approach a company takes. Any more questions? Um, as we prepare to wrap up this particular session. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Walid Abdurrahman. I'm a global shaper from Egypt as well. And uh, my question is, um, you've addressed some of it, but not in clear priorities. In order to retain talent in the continent, number one, and to close the knowledge gap that we have, what are the key priorities in this ecosystem that we have today in order to, en to enable the youth to be at par with the rest of the world in terms of knowledge and access to knowledge. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Minister, um, I think it's a, it's a nice closing question yes. for you. Yes. Well, I think uh, you can, in fact, uh, regain talent 
uh, but the talent must have something of interest that they wish to work with. So the Square Kilometre Array, for example, has been a really good opportunity for us. And we've seen several researchers who hadn't imagined they'll come back and work for a long term on the continent so it's actually now that doing catalyst, so. That so it catalyst. becomes a magnet mm. uh, uh, for talent, which is great. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we've created a, a set of interventions. We've created 150 research chairs in a range of disciplines. And we're attracting high caliber academics who have an international reputation. And their master's students are following them to do their PhDs here. So you've got to create the opportunity. But linked to that, there must be knowledge institutions in your country. Because if you produce all these knowledge workers and there's nothing for them to do, then it, they'll essentially go overseas. Mm. So I think the institutional architecture of Africa is still rather small. It's growing. We're improving. And I agree with the uh, gentleman from Egypt who spoke first, that actually we need to move away from this lamenting. I think given where we were 20 years ago, we've moved a huge space with respect to technology. Much more attention to research, far more investment, both by governments and the private sector. So I think we're in a very different space. Um, you know, someone sometimes wants me to reduce it to the basic, and here's my basic example. We built Southern Africa's largest optical telescope in a small little town in the Northern Cape called Sutherland. When we were building that telescope, we had two bed and breakfasts. Today, there are 42. Why? Researchers, postgraduate students are all tracking there because they want to use that telescope. So science and the socioeconomic challenges you face in a society actually match in a very interesting way and can interface to address the development challenges that you wish to attend to. This is a great example. If you are planning to go to Sutherland, please dress warmly. It's the coldest place in <laughs> yeah. the country. And Nijeka, 30 seconds, uh, your thoughts. Uh, well, I, I know that you know victims assume the world as it is. Uh, master, masters of technology actually create the future that they envision for themselves. And like the minister said, you know, we have made great progress over the last five to 10 years, but so has the rest of the world. We need to continue to make that progress in the right direction, again, with the enabling environment that works the best, so the intersection of the government, private, and civil society. Solomon? Uh, you know, the continent has many countries, many languages, many tribes. But if there is one thing that ties all of us together is the language of science. It doesn't matter where you are in Abuja or Johannesburg, science, the laws of physics are the same. And I think we have to use it as a way, as a way of inspiring the youth on what they could do. We have to be bold enough to say that the next 10 Nobel uh, prizes will be yeah. in Africa, will be given to Africans. We have to be bold enough to say that we're going to ride that exponential curve, and the grand challenges that we have will be solved by using 3D printers, as you say, artificial intelligence, and, and some of the cutting technologies. Acha? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll say, I think, you know, technology, and for me in particular, the internet uh, will have a transformative impact on the continent. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll disrupt a bunch of sectors, but more importantly, it'll transform how we live our lives in Africa. And you know, I'm hugely excited about it, and it's just a great, it's great to be in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please will you thank our panel. Thank you very much for your participation today. I hope you enjoyed the panel discussion. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it illuminating as well, all about the African continent and enabling a future that some, I think, can see very clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you.